we finally come to this two stage prior in a hierarchical model. So, like I said, hierarchical model can be done in many different ways, even in a question like this. You see that one given data set, but you can have different uh, ways to do that. So, in class today, I will um, cover a particular one, uh, but there are flexibility in terms of doing other ones. So, you can uh, explore that out of class if you want. So, uh, the normal model inference, just a quick review. Uh, when both parameters mu and sigma are unknown, we know that the sampling density, so this is still um, just IID for all of the observations, okay? So just quickly review over here that you have the IID normal for the sampling, and then you put independent priors for mu and sigma, right? You put a gamma uh, normal for mu, and then a gamma for the precision one over sigma squared. Then, uh, if you remember, we did a forgive sampling uh, before the break, that uh, equation six and seven, both of them are full conditional posterior distributions, right? And then that's how you can keep, um, keep the um, sampling going so you'll be able to sample um, approximation to the final posterior distribution to summarize um, P and mu. So that's what we know, okay? So good to keep those in mind. And if we're gonna do the group specific model, like what we did, it's gonna be exactly the same as what we did before, right? Because you put everything in a separate group and then pretty much your uh, yij iid so in here you see the label that i do so mu j and sigma j they are j specific or group specific right so that's why we have this subgroup for the label and i in this case the iid is referring to the observations yi in the same j so within the same j there is still iid so you have group specific mean and standard deviation so then everything will be very similar to what we did before. You put a normal prior from mu j, a gamma prior, or I should say a gamma prior for one over sigma j squared. You put um, independent priors there and then you use Gibbs, either you write it up yourself or use Jax um, to make, uh, to generate posterior samples and then perform MCMC diagnostic, summarize results. And now the question here is how can we link the mu j's and sigma j's in some way if we believe they're related? And I should, I guess, uh, be more specific, link uh, the mu j's among themselves, okay, and sigma j's among themselves, not between them, okay? So um, the question now is how we can do that. So from the video uh, recorded by Professor DeLeo, I think you saw that well. If we want to link them in some way, we can put the same prior distribution for that, okay? For example, you can put the same prior distribution for all of the mu j, okay? You can also put the same prior distribution for all of the sigma j. So that would be a typical way to do a hierarchical modeling. So I think now we have the understanding that you can put the same prior, but what does it mean to put a same, the same prior? So that's what we're going to uh, discuss over here. Uh, so without loss of generality, I'm just going to do a group specific normal for group j with the shared um, standard deviation, but different mean. Okay, so you see that I, put, I highlight the sigma mean um, red. So I'm just saying that for simplicity, I'm assuming that for each of the normal models, there are four, right? There are four here. For each of the normal models, I'm using the same standard deviation, but I have a schedule specific mean, and I use mu j over here. So again, this is for simplicity. So we're using a commonly shared uh, sigma. Um, and the rest of the lecture will be based on this particular model. But before we move on, do you think this is a reasonable model to do? Let me just show you um, the summary statistics really quick. Maybe check with your neighbor to see if you think it makes sense to have a shared, commonly shared sigma in this case. Right, so I think it comes down with you. Um, the summary statistics table, like, what would be useful information for us to, to reason through whether a, share, a commonly shared sigma is a good choice or not? What should we be looking at? What do we mean by having the same sigma for each of the four models? Yeah. Um, the standard deviation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Equation nine here is talking about, well, within each group, I believe that the standard deviation should be the same, okay? So if we look at this column, the standard deviation column here, I think you probably pretty quickly notice that, well, um, 
the schedule four is almost what, like eight times, so what, schedule three, what have, right? The sample standard deviation. So that probably gives us a good sense that it's probably not a good idea to have a commonly shared stigma in this case, okay? So I just want to raise this up because you do need to care about what the data, uh, like the features of that is telling you and um, it is important to, to do this kind of explore data analysis. Um, for simplicity, we're just gonna use this, especially uh, for this relatively simple model that we're covering right now, equation nine. I want we all to get the practice of uh, doing a little bit more derivation of the posterior for conditional posterior distribution or whatever, so I'm just staying simple. But you can easily do um, a separate sigma j, like what we did, but then put the same prior for sigma j. Okay, but for now, for simplicity, uh, we're actually um, making probably not a good decision here of choosing the same sigma. Um, but I think it's good to, to talk about them beforehand and keep that in mind. And I will leave uh, the case for schedule specific mu j and sigma j as an exercise towards the end of this. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is where we are now. And we are making the assumption that we have a group-specific normal model for group J, but we only have mu J as group-specific, the mu, but sigma is being shared across different schedules. So what you do, like um, the way that you can do this two-stage prior that we've been talking about is through equation 11, that we're going to use the same or shared normal prior distribution for mu J. Okay? And in particular for conjugacy, for simplicity later, uh, you will see that using a normal prior probably is a good choice because you can actually derive all of the full conditional posterior distributions later. So, um, so we're going to put mu j follows a normal with mean mu and standard deviation tau. So my question for you to discuss with your neighbor now is what does this prior mean? So mu j's, like mu1, mu2, mu3, mu4 in this case, because we have four different schedules, right? So they're random, right? They are the parameter in the sampling model, okay? So now we're giving priors to these random parameters, which is fine, we've been doing that for a while. But what's special here is that we're giving the same prior for all of the means. So think about what does this prior mean? Especially because in equation 11, we're giving a normal prior for all of the mu j. Okay? So we know about the normal prior or normal distribution. The mean, mu, in this case, in equation 11, is talking about the average, right? Like we're saying on average what this mu j should be. Okay? And tau, the standard deviation, is giving us a sense of how widely spread all of the mu j's will be. Okay? So think about what this prior means. And you can probably like maybe approach this by thinking about, well, what if I choose a large mu? Or how should I choose mu? Okay? And also, how should I choose my tau? Okay? And what does that imply in terms of what the prior belief that you're having? Okay? So take some time. Um, maybe you can play with some like particular numbers you want um, to, to talk about uh, that with your neighbor as well. So, what do you think this prior means in our setup? Right? Um, equation 11. What I would say, based on what we saw in the summary statistics, as well as the uh, density plot comparison, how would you choose your mu and tau? So, first of all, mu and tau, as we later will see, will be the hyperparameters because they are parameters on the distribution of the parameters. Okay? So, what you can do is you can keep putting hyper priors on them. I just keep going the later if you want. Um, but you can also just pick a particular value for them. So if for now we assume that we're trying to give particular values for mu and tau in this case, how are you gonna decide on those values if you were to give a particular values for them? What's your thought process then? Well, so we just like looked at the data from mm -hmm. the few slides ago mm -hmm. and we noted that like, it seems there's like a lot of spread amongst the uh, sample means. Mm -hmm. So we thought like reasonably high value of tau. And then we just like looked at the means themselves and mm -hmm. thought that 
pretty close to 0.1 of most of them. Like there's like an extreme about 0.1 and then mm -hmm. two extremes about 0.1 a low and a high extreme. Right. So I said 0.1 might be a reasonable mean mm -hmm. with like a pretty high tau thinking like 0.05 or mm -hmm. 0.075, something mm -hmm. like that maybe. Yeah, so good point. So if you look at the summary statistics table that we uh, obtained earlier, this mean column, you can see that, well, there's, uh, I mean, between the first two, probably not a big difference, but among the four altogether, it's pretty um, widely different from each other, especially three is extremely small, and then four is extremely large, right? So that, if we think about what does that mean, and what does that translate into equation 11? So equation 11 is putting the same normal trial for mu j, so we just focus on the mean, right? And we see that in the data, there's a big variation among the sample means, so that would give us, I think, a good indication that the standard deviation among the means themselves should not be small. Okay? So I think that's what Zach is trying to say, that you might want to put a large value, in this case for tau, and for mu itself, well, maybe you can uh, look at the data, etc. Julie? But how do we know that tau is big before we even have the data? Because we're trying to find a prior, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same question here? Yeah. Like, can you not look at your data when you're coming mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so good point. So the thing is, um, at the end of the day, I guess, um, if you try to put some really what we call weakly informative prior, in a sense that it's pretty uh, vague, or like just let the data decide, then the effect of the prior wouldn't matter that much in terms of the posterior, right? So I think it's, it's a good uh, comment here that, well, should we look at the data or not? Um, but overall, I guess it's probably a good idea to put large um, tau value for this mu, just because we might not know exactly how varied they are, okay? But if you look at the data, that probably gives you a hint that, well, I might want to have a large tau value because I want them to be varied, okay? And um, yeah, so in terms of well, how large is large, um, I guess um, sometimes people like even just put like, so the range of the rating is what, from 0 to 0.3, right? So it probably doesn't make sense to give like tau to be even one or two, because it's not, but sometimes people do that, it's fine. You would just work fine. I was gonna ask like, if you put a huge large tau value, mm -hmm. like would it kind of just be almost like a uniform distribution? In a sense, because that's what you're saying is like it's so spread out that it's so flat that everything kind of has an equal amount of chance. Right, right, yeah. Right. So if you think about, okay, good point. So if we think about a normal, so we know that usually a normal, like I would say usually uh, look like this, but if you have a super large um, standard deviation comparing, like if you fix the mean, right, and then you have a much larger um, standard deviation, then it will be like something like this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in some way, yeah, I wouldn't say exactly like uniform, but it's approaching to that. And then that would just be what we mean by a really uh, like a vaguely really informative, weak. very weakly informative right. prior. Yeah. So the reason I should mention that um, why we're doing a normal in this case is, um, first of all, later we're going to try to derive the full conditional posterior. So with conjugacy, it will work the best. But later you will see that we're going to rely on Jax to do the MCMC simulation for us. So in a sense, you can use whatever prior you want. So like what Jonathan says, if you want to use a uniform, go for it. It's fine. But it's pretty, I think it's a good uh, practice to do beforehand to think about like, yes, if I'm trying to give a normal prior, how should I pick my mu and tau based on my prior belief? Okay, so whatever is you're choosing, I think is conveying some kind of choices and conveying some kind of ideas that you have. So just, um, make make um extra I would say make um decisions like step by step and then based on your understanding of the distributions themselves. So again, um I should also mention I guess um mu j's come from the same prior distribution. They're related but they're not the same. Okay, they're all random. They just come from the same prior distribution. So make sure that um don't think that they're all the same. They all come from the same prior distribution. So mu is the mean, so we know controls where like we think the mu j most likely gonna occur. And tau is the standard deviation. And of course, larger tau means larger variability among the mu j's. So that's one thing you can choose if you're gonna do a normal um, prior um, for this case. And again, like I said, mu and tau, they're called hyper priors because they're parameters of distribution so the correct. All right, so, so that's good. And uh, so that's what we call the stage one prior. 
from UJ, the equation 13 on this slide now. And what we do, so of course, mu and tau, well, uh, what we're going to do about this, um, you can give fixed numbers like what we said earlier, but you can also keep giving distributions for them. Okay, so right now I'm very generically writing equation 14 as just g, like say mu and tau follows this g mu and tau for now, and later we're going to see how to put particular hyperparameters for them. But if you want to stop here just giving um, specific numbers, that will work as well. But you lose the flexibility to model them. If you give a fixed number, so you just assume that they're fixed. Uh, you might want to model them as well. And uh, also don't forget sigma. Sigma is still random, even though we assume that they're commonly shared. But it is still random, so you should put prior for them uh, for it as well. Um, so for simplicity, we're going to put a um, conjugate. So later you're going to see that it's going to be conjugated again. It's going to be uh, 1 over sigma squared to be um, gamma. And in this case, I put the subscript um, alpha sigma and beta sigma to indicate that it's the priors for the gamma priors for sigma. Okay. Make sense overall? OK. So don't forget there's sigma. And uh, for the mu j, since we're sharing information across them, so we have this two-stage prior. All right, so um, we like to do some graphical representation of hierarchical models. So for the one that we have right now, um, I present the graphical representation for you um, on the screen at the moment. So you will see that we're trying to use, um, well, different layers, um, but you typically you can start drawing your, um, coming up with your graphical representation based on like say from the data first, right? So we have different groups. So that's why I have yi1 to yij. Okay, so and I use curly bracket to represent that there are multiple observations in each. And then for each of the group, we know that for the data, first of all, we share the same sigma, right? So the sigma goes to like using the arrow directing from the parameter to the data. Okay, so that's what this is about. And then on the top, what we have is, first of all, we know that we have group-specific means, right? So for, um, for the first group, I have mu1. For the last group, I have mu j. In our example, j equals to 4. Okay, but generically, we just use capital J. And lastly, don't forget that because we assume, so this is representing the two-stage prior that we talked about, right? We assume that they are um, sharing the same prior distribution, and they are controlled by these two parameters, mu and tau. So we, on the top, write mu and tau, and then the arrows are directing to different mu j's. So this is one way to um, do the representation. And I would say that, well, if you are thinking about, just, just a side note, if you are thinking about a more flexible model, I'll remember of the different um, sigma as well, then you can write your, um, I mean, at, let me just clear this. You can get your um, updated so you don't have this one anymore, but you're going to have group specific sigma j, okay, pointing the arrow pointing to, to the data, and then you might have some extra parameter over here to um, control all of the sigma j. So, graphical representation can help you, I think, uh, get a sense of how the hierarchical. Uh, is being done. Well, I would say that this type of um, representation is probably mostly done in the statistics community. But as you have seen in the video, I guess in Coxi and many other applied uh, fields, like they have even fancier ways to do all of those um, graphical representation. Like they can even show you, like say, what I think the distribution will look like on these particular parameters. So that's what you have seen. So all of them will work. Um, for, for us, I guess this is probably cleaner and just you can actually just draw it by hand if you want from scratch. So keep in mind the arrows, they're pointing from parameters to random variables and then from hyperparameters to parameters. Okay, so keep in mind the use of that. All right, so lastly, we have, um, we need to talk about the hyperparameters that we're going to do for this new and tau. And I guess not surprisingly, what we're going to do is a normal prior or normal hyper prior for mu and a gamma hyper prior for one over tau squared. Okay? Because again, it is a mean and it's a standard deviation. Okay, so following what we did before, you can put a normal for this mean and put a gamma for its precision. 
there. So that's why you see that uh, further subscript here and there, um, especially with the gamma here, trying to differentiate between this gamma and this gamma. So they're working on different um, parameters in this case. So you can put a subscript here and there. And then for mu, I'm using mu zero and gamma zero for the mean and the standard deviation. Okay, so this pretty much is the complete specification of the model itself. You start from the sampling, and then for the mu j's, we have this two stage prior. And then within it, you have to work with the hyper prior. But then don't forget that sigma is random as well, so you need to give the prior to it as well. Alrighty, so.